Shalom, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this week's Sabbath service. I want to start off by reading a scripture from Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. For prayer requests this week, I would ask that you please pray for the sick and the afflicted, those that are emotionally distressed, those that are suffering in spiritual darkness and loneliness. I feel like a big part of the duties of the fellowship is to help fight the war against loneliness. We are all connected through modern technology, but loneliness seems to be at an all-time high in our world. Please pray for those that watch these videos but feel like they are stuck, like they can't be here with us. Help them to, but well, pray that the Lord will help them to overcome their fears and their anxieties. And please pray for those that are seeking that they will find. We're running into more and more people that are interested in joining the fellowship or working with us in some way. Time zone, again, has become a huge issue. So we also ask that you pray that we'll be able to meet together and find the times that will work for everyone. Beyond that, I don't have any specific prayer requests for you. Well, not this week. I feel impressed by the Spirit, though, to ask that when you say your prayers, please do a special prayer for peace. Peace throughout the world. Peace within ourselves. But this, let's make this a Sabbath. This is the Sabbath of Sukkot. So let's make this a Sabbath where we pray for peace. If you'd like to take a moment now to pause the video, sing a hymn, say an opening prayer, please do so. We're going to go ahead and do our moment of unity. I am going to read the Shema, first in Hebrew and then in English. And then there will be space for everyone to read the Shema back in English. Shema Yisrael, Yavah Elohenu, Yavah Echad. Hero Israel, Yavah is our Elohim, Yavah is unity. In the church that I grew up in, and it wasn't just my church, in the community I grew up in, my friends that were religious in their churches, they taught the same thing. There was this idea of there's only one true church, and it's the one that I belong to. And this scripture, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, that got pounded pretty hard into us. And that meant that at school, I had religious conversations with friends and with teachers. Sometimes with teachers, they weren't conversations. They were more like lectures about how Dave was going to go to hell for being Mormon. But there was still this idea. There was one Lord, Jesus. But there was only one Jesus, and it was their Jesus. My Jesus was wrong. And from my perspective, my Jesus was right, and theirs was wrong. There was only one faith. It was whatever faith you belong to. So the church I went to was that one faith, and everybody else was wrong. And they, they told me the same thing. I was wrong, and they were right. One baptism. You're not truly baptized unless you're baptized into a particular church whether it was the one I belong to or the one that they belong to. And so there was this, this war, this, this war of theologies and of ideologies. But I want to flip the script on this because I do believe that this is true, but I don't believe it's true the way that my teachers, my friends, and even I were taught as I was growing up. And I want to include the entire sentence here. There is one body. Is that this body? Does that mean I'm the only thing that exists in the whole universe? That's pretty deep, pretty profound. And in one sense, 
yes, we are the hero of our own story. Our entire lives are our narrative. We only see things from our perspective. We can try to see things from other people's perspective, and I encourage you to do so. But in the end, even then, it's still our interpretation of that. So then, what does this mean, one body? It can't just mean it's all about me, because that's egoism. So let's take it a step further. There's one body, and that could be the church that you belong to. All of you have the same, or at least similar enough, theologies, right? You're all seeking the things you have in common, and you, you hunker down in that war against the whole rest of the world. But I think it's bigger than that. I think that it could be, since I grew up in the Latter-day Saint movement, I'll say all Latter-day Saints. We are one body. But we're one body that smacks itself on the hand, slaps itself in the face. Because we attack our body. We attack each other within our movement. But that doesn't mean we're not one body. It just means we're one body that seems to enjoy inflicting harm upon itself. But I want to take this further. I don't think it's just the Latter-day Saint movement. I also think it's all of Christianity. No matter what brand of Christianity you have, and I'm going to call it brand because we do, we, it's branding, we market our churches. Whatever brand you belong to, you have at least one thing in common with every other church, whatever it is. Even Jehovah's Witnesses, people love to pick on them, but they have at least one thing in common with every church. Let's do a more fun one. What's that, uh, the racist church? The uh, Western Baptists? Even they have one thing in common with every other church. And yes, I do see them as a hate group. But I want to expand this out. I want to make this even bigger. Not just all of Christianity. But Christianity, what is Christianity? It's nothing more than offshoot of Judaism. We are basically Jews that, well, we're not Jews, we're Israelites, I guess. But we, we this, these Jews started this new thing, and other Jews didn't like it. They called it Christianity. Pagans jumped on it. And suddenly the Jews and the Gentiles merged together and created this whole new religion. But we, we came from Judaism. And so, therefore, we worship the same God. So let's put the Jews in this umbrella as well. Not just the Jews. Because really Abraham is the one that started all of this. And Islam would be an Abrahamic religion. And I guarantee you that every Christian church, every Jewish church, and every branch of Islam, we can all find at least one thing in common. We may look at God differently. We may look at lots of things differently. But at the end of the day, we will all have at least one thing in common. Now, I want to take this further. There are other religions that believe in other gods. But we're still all part of the human race. Therefore, we're all still one body as the creation of God and as the spirit children of heavenly parents speaking in my language from my religious background. I believe and I testify to you that if you look at every world religion, we will all have at least one thing, at least one thing in common. So this body starts off as this cell that is me, this nucleus. And it expands out through everything because God didn't just create me and nothing else God didn't just create the fellowship and nothing else God didn't just create the Latter-day Saint movement and nothing else God created everything because God is the creator one spirit 
I like the idea. Yep, I've got one spirit inside of me. That spirit has existed eternally. What is a spirit? If we have the body, we have the physical. And if we have a spirit, we have the metaphysical, the intellectual, the feelings, emotions, the baggage. The spirit is what gives it is what gives the body life. So in me, in this this cell, this nucleus, I have a spirit. But there's also the spirit of the fellowship, where we all come together, which doesn't really happen very often because we're online and in different time zones. So let's get bigger. Let's go with the whole Latter Day Saint movement. There are actually times and events where we gather together. Normally, it's to go over scholarly and very opinionated things instead of getting really deep and spiritual. But there are times when we all gather together as Latter-day Saints. Think about the Christian Holy Days, Easter, Christmas. There are times when we get together with our fellow Christians. We exist in this world where we group together with other people of the Abrahamic faith. We share in discussions with people of other religions. And that brings life to the body of us being together. So this one body and this one spirit can be me, but it can also be all of us and all of creation. So it says, there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One hope. What is that hope? Salvation? Exaltation? Is it a financial hope? Are you struggling financially and you're just praying to God to put food on the table? Is it emotional hope? Are you lonely? Whatever it is, there's hope. Hope is the enemy of despair. It is the conqueror of despair. And therefore, we have hope in Jesus Christ as Christians. We have hope in God as human beings that have found religion. And even atheists have hope. They hope that they are right. They hope that there is no God. They hope for better things. Hope is what sustains us. It's what moves us forward. And I feel that this is the trinity of growth. The acknowledgement of the one body, the one spirit, the life of that body, and the hope, the enemy of despair that keeps us going. Satan is the father of despair, of doubt, of lies. He wants us to be miserable so that we'll turn against God and join his forces. That's his hope. But the fact that we don't, the fact that we cling to truth, that is our hope. And that hope comes in Jesus Christ, which leads to verse 5. Verse 5 is the, the core message of this sentence. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, one thing I was reminded of repeatedly growing up is that it says Lord, because in the Latter-day Saint movement I belonged to, there were many gods, many, many, many gods. But Jesus was Lord. And when I say that, I should clarify that you know, there's God, the Father, and then he had a wife, and some people saw her as a goddess, and some people didn't. And then the other gods would be, you know, the gods that came before him, the God that came after him, and, and it was all really um, theologically hypothetical, although it's something that that particular sect taught at the time. I don't know that they're still teaching it, and it was something that was taught more privately from the older teachings from when Brigham Young started that church. So I, I don't want you to hear me say this and think I'm slamming my Salt Lake City church friends. That's just the, what I was taught growing up. And I know that they've changed quite a bit since I've left. But that one Lord, I think we can all agree as, as Christians, is Jesus Christ. 
He is the one, the mediator between us and our heavenly parents. I don't like just saying the father because I do believe that there is a mother and I don't believe that we should reject her. I don't believe that we should put her on the sidelines. I don't believe that she's some something that's so sacred we can't talk about her. I, I think that that is more male egoism, that we can't fathom the idea of a woman being equal to a man, to be quite frank. And I'm sorry if that offends you. It's just, that's my view. You don't have to share it. But I do believe that Jesus represents the mother just like he represents the father. As a Mormon Kabbalist, if you look at the Tree of Life, the way it's set up for Mormon Kabbalah, you have the father on the top left pillar, the mother on the top right, and Jesus is just below the mother, which would be to the right hand of the father. So he can represent both the father and the mother. But being a patriarchal society in our religious beliefs, the mother is generally ignored. And I do believe that as part of the restoration of all things, she, our understanding of her is being restored. But that's a little bit off topic. I can talk about that in one of the Thursday thoughts if you'd like. What I want to talk about is this one Lord. We all have to funnel through Jesus Christ. Why? Jesus was a God, capital G, before he came here. He was a God made flesh. The Word made flesh, as John says in John 1 through 5. First, I'm sorry, John chapter 1, 1 through 5. He came here not to learn about us, not to see what it's like, but because something about him coming here as an exalted being, as the only begotten of the Father, there's something about him coming here, walking the earth to teach us, then leaving his body behind. I, I don't believe that anybody killed him. When it said when the, when the Bible says that he gave up the ghost, I don't believe that the Jews or the Romans killed Jesus. I don't think that they could because he's God. I think that he thought, well, not he thought, he knew he's God. Now is the time. I believe that if the Jews would not have captured him and turned him over to the Romans, and if the Romans would not have hung him on the cross, I believe that he was just going to give up the ghost at that time either way. We chose to send him out the worst way possible, or one of the worst ways possible. But at some point, he was going to have to choose death. Because he's the only person that ever walked the earth that could choose death, because he's God. And then three days later, he broke the chains of death through his resurrection. And by coming back to life, he unlocked the key. He turned the key to unlock the vault. I'll say it like that. So that so many other people were resurrected at that time, according to the Bible, according to the New Testament. And eventually we will all be resurrected because of this sacred act, this atonement. So because of this, whether we acknowledge Jesus as the Christ or not, he is still our Lord. He is still our Savior. And He will be resurrecting everyone as a free gift. Now what happens after that is up to us, whether we choose Jesus or not. And that gets into the one faith. We can go back to the idea of having one thing in common very easily here. Having at least one belief. As Christians, it doesn't matter what church you belong to. Again, even if you belong to the West Westro Baptist Church, they still believe that Jesus saved them. They just happen to believe a bunch of horrible stuff after that about how he's not going to save anybody else. But the reality is, in my mind, what's the difference between them going out and picketing funerals and us Knocking on doors, I mean, nobody really does that anymore, I'm speaking hypothetically, and telling people, hey, I know you love Jesus, but I want to teach you how to love him the right way because you're doing it all wrong. 
Yeah, it's pretty messed up to show up at a funeral with a bunch of signs saying that God hates all the people that they hate. That's 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 definitely not cool. But how's that any different than me telling my coworker, I know you like your church, but I want to tell you about mine and why it's better. One's just nicer. It's just more polite. Does it make it nice? And it doesn't make it polite. But it's more culturally acceptable to let the water cooler say, here's what I'm doing at my church, isn't it awesome, than, yeah, this person died, and uh, i got these people picketing out back. Instead of telling people how awesome our churches are, why can't we just talk about the things we have in common? Oh, you believe that too? That's awesome. Oh, you believe that? Oh, I believe this too. Oh, that's different. Tell me more about that. I'd like to learn more about that. I'm not saying I'm definitely going to believe it, but I'm curious. I'd like to know more about your beliefs. Now that I understand it better, I, I can relate to that. I don't fully agree, but you know, from my perspective, I can see X, Y, and Z. There are ways that we can seek truth together in our diversity. Look at American culture. I am not one of those people that believes in American exceptionalism. I'm sorry if that offends you. I just, I just don't. I, I happen to be born here. It's, it's, that's nice. There's pros and cons of living here in the U.S. Just like there's pros and cons of living everywhere else in the world. But one of the things that, in my mind, makes this country great is our diversity. Because anything that I enjoy about America comes from that blend of cultures. I love that I can get food right here in my neighborhood from all over the world. I love how art has been influenced by immigrants for hundreds of years now. Culture has been influenced by immigrants for hundreds of years now. That's why I don't worry about immigration. That's why I don't worry about immigrants coming here. I want more diversity. I want more ideas, thoughts, art, culture. Because diversity helps us think outside the box. Now, I know that there are some of you that like the fellowship that are not going to like what I just said. But how is the fellowship any different than what I just said and what some will deem as a political message. I, I don't see loving humanity as a political thing, so I'm sorry, I'm going to be a little sarcastic here. Once you start telling me that loving your neighbor is, is politics, which, yes, has happened way too much, I'm going to say, yeah, sorry. I respect your beliefs, but I, I can't agree with that. I, I, I don't see how that's a political thing at all. How can we, as a fellowship, say, I want to learn from my fellow Latter-day Saints. I want to learn from my fellow Christians. I want to learn from my fellow Abrahamic religions, my fellow Israelites, my friends and family from the Muslim community. How can we say that we're going to learn from any level of any of that and ignore all other walks of life. One body, right? So one Lord and one faith here. Find the things that we have in common. If it isn't Jesus, there's something else. There is something that can lead us to unity whether it's in Christ or in God or in the teachings of Jesus Christ. Because the things that we have in common generally are going to be something that Jesus taught, that we as Christians believe, that the Muslims also believe, that the Jews also believe, that the Buddhists believe, that the Hindus believe, that so and so on, so on, so on. Now, I'm not trying to get all universal Unitarian here. I'm not trying to say that Jesus isn't necessary because Jesus absolutely is necessary. This is the fellowship of Jesus Christ. 
He is the core message of everything that we do. What I'm saying is how can we accept others in Jesus and accept that they're not ready to accept Jesus yet? Maybe they're not going to accept Jesus in this life. We can still love them. And now as a Latter-day Saint, I get to the most important part of this message. One baptism. There were so many people growing up that wanted me to get baptized in their church because I'd only been baptized as a Mormon. Well, I personally, that's actually not true. I was baptized as a baby, Lutheran. So I've been baptized three or four times now. But I want to say that I don't believe that we get baptized into churches. When I was a baby and I was baptized by a Lutheran priest, that didn't make me a Lutheran because I was a baby. You can put my name on the rolls or whatever you want to do, but I didn't really have a choice in the matter. Likewise, when I was eight, my father baptized me. That baptism did not make me a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints out in Salt Lake City. In Kirtland, in 2018, when Christine baptized me, that did not make me a member of the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship. Baptism is done because we individually feel called to be baptized. We've accepted the Jesus, we've accepted the grace of Jesus Christ. We've repented of our sins. And now we're saying, I feel called. I feel moved. Just like Nephi. When Nephi saw Jesus baptized, he felt that in his heart. I need, if Jesus needs to be baptized, I need to be baptized. And I know that in our fervor, we may say, well, if Jesus was baptized, then everybody has to be baptized. But I want to say to you, don't get pushy. Let the Holy Spirit tell people when and if they need to be baptized. I believe that God accepted my baptism as a baby because I was innocent. And so I may not have needed baptism, but there was faith there. I believe that God accepted my baptism when I was eight because I had already dedicated my life to him. And I believe that God accepted my baptism in 2018 because I felt moved by the Spirit to be baptized again. And I have to tell you, being baptized by my wife was an absolutely beautiful thing. I'll never remember, in this life anyway, being baptized by that Lutheran priest. I have no idea who he was. I know it was somewhere in Columbus. That's, that's really all I know. But I'll never forget being baptized by my father. I'll never forget being baptized by my wife. Those are special moments to me because my family was involved. The one baptism wasn't being dunked underwater. The one baptism was when I personally accepted Jesus Christ. That's the true baptism. Being dunked in water, performing the ritual, That is merely an outward expression of the inward commitment we've already taken. That act doesn't wash us clean of our sins. Jesus already did that. It just lets the world know that we've been washed clean of our sins. It lets the world know we have been buried and risen again in the name of Jesus. It's a ritual. It's a sacrament. It's symbolic. But of itself, it has no power. It only has the power that we give it through the power of God. Otherwise, we could just go baptize everybody and everyone would just be saved, right? Just baptize everybody every day right before bed. And everybody's going to heaven. Does that make sense? I know a lot of people are like, yeah, no, that's not how this works. 
So why do we baptize children? I will take a moment here to say, make sure your child is getting baptized because they want to build a personal relationship with God and not because culturally we've been taught that at a certain age it must happen. Because your child will grow closer to God if they choose to be baptized. Otherwise, it's just a quick bath for them. It's just something to make mommy and daddy happy. Or daddy and daddy. Or mommy and mommy. So if we are going to serve one Lord in one faith with one baptism, let's make sure that baptism is the baptism of our hearts. Verse 6, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Now, again, being raised in the Brighamite church, it's like, ah, ha, ha, Jesus is Lord, Father, it's Elohim. And I would add one God, the Father and the Mother. And whether you believe that they're the same person or two different people, I still believe that they are one God. Because Jesus and the Father are one God. It says so in the Book of Mormon. As finite beings, we have a problem with that because I have two hands. I can't just say I've got one hand. If we want to say that we have the father and the mother, what is it that, that connects them, that makes them one God? Well, they're, my hands are attached to this body. And likewise, the father and mother, whether they're the same being, that's unisex or non-sex, non-gendered, or whether they actually are an eternal male and an eternal female, they are still one. They are sealed together. They are one, completely united in purpose, in thought, in everything, in power. I often wonder if, when I read these scriptures, does it say one God and Father because it was changed? Did it originally say just one God and one parent? Or one set of parents? Did it originally say one God who is father and mother? Or was it always this way? And this is a letter. So is it this way because that's Paul's understanding and he just doesn't know about the Divine Feminine yet? Because I don't believe that Lehi would have written the letter this way. He came from a time when the Divine Feminine was openly accepted. Lehi came from a time when the idea of a Divine Feminine was openly accepted. I genuinely believe that if if Paul and the others that wrote these letters would have known that 2,000 years after they wrote them, for those 2,000 years, people were going to be using them to fight and nitpick and build churches upon random sentences that they said, I think they would have chosen their words much more carefully. But that doesn't mean that their words don't have value. It does mean that we need to look for the deeper meaning of what could have been said. So we say one God and Father and Mother of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. What does that mean? This is where we're going to be wrapping up here. We talked about the one body, the one spirit, the one hope, the one Lord, the one faith, the one baptism. Those are the three there. Now we have one God, one Father, above all, through all, and in you all. The core message here, though, is that we have one body, one Lord, who is above all. We have one spirit, one faith that is through all. We have one spirit, one baptism that is in us all. 
That to me is the theological trinity. And these are the things that can unite us and will unite us if we will just stop fighting, stop bickering, and learn how to love one another. I want to close this by sharing with you Doctrines of the Saints 3B14. And this is from the Constitution of the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship. And verse 14 is our beliefs on the proper conduct of the saints. You may recognize it as Article 13 from Articles of Faith from the Brighamite churches. We believe in being honest, true, chaste, temperate, benevolent, virtuous, and upright, and doing good to all men. Indeed, we may say that we follow the admonition of Paul. We believe all things. We hope all things. We have endured many things, and we hope to be able to endure all things. Everything virtuous, lovely, praiseworthy, and good report, we seek after these things. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. How do we find that unity? How do we find that oneness? It's right here. We don't literally have to believe all things because some things contradict each other. But we can respect the beliefs of others that are different from our own. We can hope all things. Hope is one of the central messages. But most importantly, this to me is the key. Everything virtuous, lovely, praiseworthy, and good report, we seek after these things. So if you want to know how to understand the one body, the one spirit, and the one hope, to find the one Lord, the one faith, and the one baptism, from the God who is above all, through all, and in us all, then I would encourage you to seek after everything virtuous, lovely, praiseworthy, and of good report. That's my message, and I leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We are now going to proceed to the Sacrament of Communion. For those who are not familiar with how we do this, we're going to play a recording of the Statement on Communion, and then Christine is going to offer both of the sacramental prayers. At that point, you'll be able to pause the video and partake of the sacrament. If you would like to take the sacrament with us and you do not have bread and water or bread and wine available right now with you, then I would recommend you just pause the video and go and get that and lay it out so that Christine can bless it for you. But we'll proceed at that point. At this time, we welcome all present to Christ's table. We invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of Jesus Christ, in whose name we worship. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament, a time to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to his mission, to grow closer to Jesus Christ as individuals and as a community, worshiping Jesus Christ through God's word, the sacrament, ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. O God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of Thy Son and witness unto Thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments which he hath given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. O God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do so in remembrance of the blood of thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his spirit to be with them. Amen. I want to thank you for taking the time to worship with us this week. 
whether it's Saturday or Sunday or some other day that you had available. I'm very thankful that we're able to provide an opportunity for you to be able to worship with us. And I'm very thankful that you're taking the time to do so. I've had several requests now for in-person meetings. We do not have a set time. We do not have a set number of people that will show up. But I will promise you that right now I've got 10 o'clock blocked off. If that works for people, shoot me an email, info at cjccf.org if you're interested. I will set up a, a meeting where we can all get together and watch the video together because it's got to start somewhere. But I'm going to tell you right now, if it's just me and one other person, I will do this. I watch the videos at 10 o'clock anyway in case anybody pops on to YouTube and wants to chat. So if you need this, if you need someone there with you, it's got to start somewhere. So if it's just me and you, let's start with me and you. And other people can come as they come. If 10 o'clock isn't what works, let me know what does. We'll see what we can do to accommodate you. And we may end up having to set something up where I'm watching with people at one time and other people are watching with other people at another time. I don't know. But we can get there. We can do this. We're not alone. We're just separated geographically. So let's figure out how we can take the first steps to move forward. Also, if this message moved you, I would encourage you to please like the video, subscribe to this channel, and share the video with others. It's the only way this message is going to get out. And if it means something to you, I promise you it'll mean something to somebody else. We're now going to have a closing prayer. Elohim Shaddai, your barber has before you at this time. Thank you for this opportunity we've had to pray together, to worship together, partake of the sacrament of communion together. We ask you to please bless us. Help us to be of one faith. Help us to unite in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Help us to find the things that we have in common. You've been sending people to us, Father, that can help with the temple, and we appreciate that. We thank you for this blessing and the opportunity you're providing for us. We ask that you please continue to bless us with the financial resources we need, with the people that we need, with the experts that we need, that we will be able to build a place that is pleasing unto thee, where we can gather as saints, regardless of the denomination, and worship as one. Where we may perform your rituals and teach others their purpose, their power, their reality, what they are and what they're about. We ask you to please bless us with the strength and the courage and conviction that we need to move forward in faith, in your works, and in your holy name. And we do ask you for the financial resources that we need to accomplish these tasks and these goals. There are many things that we need to do, you've asked us to do, and to do this, we need time, we need talent, we need financial resources, which means that we need people. We have many people that are watching the work, and we thank you for these people. We ask that you please send us the brothers and sisters that we need that can help feed these sheep, help facilitate their growth, help build thy kingdom upon the earth. We can't ask everyone. To be in these videos or to be active in the 
hold an active role or an active calling in this work. But we do ask us, we do ask thee, we do ask you to help us find those that you have called as shepherds. Men and women, priests and priestesses, prophets and prophetesses, those with the skills, the talents, the time to ensure that your work will be done. We know that you've called them. And there are many of us here waiting to hear from them. So we ask that you please bless us and bless them that we may be united in one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And those that are working to help build this fellowship, we ask that you please bless them with the resources they need, the time, the talent, the financial resources, that they can accomplish your goals in ways that are pleasing unto thee. We are working to build your kingdom, to build your temple. And we ask that you please bless us the things that we need to make our burdens lighter and make the things that seem impossible now possible. Again, we thank you for all your blessings. We thank you for all the amazing resources you have provided for us and all the people that you have sent, all those that are worshiping together in thy name. And in the name of thy Son, we say these things. Even Jesus Christ, so mote it be. Amen.